day and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is the daily show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Dennis Zen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. It's an unusually packed day for Friday for news, and we're about to talk about all that stuff. Also here is Perry Nemiroff. I'm pretty sure the only stories that matter on this lineup are Starship Troopers and La La Land. <laughs> Double feature right there. <laughs> and also John Roca. Hello everyone, how are you? Welcome to another Friday. I'm looking forward to talking about all this stuff. There's so much news! And I wore my kick-ass Captain America shirt today, so let's get it on. All right, uh, before we get started with our regularly scheduled program here on the side, we actually had another trailer drop, which you, which you saw in the title and the thumbnail, which is the Lego Batman movie. This is, I think, I don't know, this is like the fourth trailer, mm. fifth trailer. We've seen a lot of trailers for this. It's coming out in February. Roka, what, what's your take on this new trailer? Oh my God, I absolutely loved it. I, you, know, I, you know, it's funny, so many trailers with new footage, you think, well, I've seen the movie. It does not apply in this situation. You are so it gets you more and more excited. We saw a little more with Alfred, which Ray Ray Fiennes is doing such a fantastic job voicing him, and Michael Sarah, who we've kind of not seen a lot of recently. I think like this is the end is really the last time I like was aware of Sarah still doing stuff. So it's nice to see him voicing this, and you get the. You, it just it looks like it's going to be a great, great time in the theater, and a nice little take on the Batman mythology without. But Lego does such a great job of making fun of things, but still revering them at the same time. They do that with the Star Wars stuff all the time so this is just another example of it and just it gets me even more and more excited and it's the best use of best use of black and yellow that i've ever seen on anything so <laughs> i'm such a fan of it perry yeah i was gonna say that this trailer has uh, i think like two or three really perfect songs in there yeah. where it brings so much energy and then it's you know a nod to the actual material like yeah. that and michael Sarah sounds pretty damn perfect for this role <laughs> yes, he does. i don't really think that they could have voice cast that role any better but this might just because i haven't watched the other lego batman trailers in a while but I feel like this is the first time we're kind of taking a step back and seeing the bigger picture too with the with the city and all the other minifigs right. out there and again just like the Lego movie this looks like some incredible world building pun intended <laughs> this movie looks fantastic the animation I think is going to be just as good as Lego movie I couldn't be more excited for this I'm so excited it's coming out so soon because I, I wasn't sure about the release date right. and it's a nice like a holdover too, because we heard that the Lego movie sequel was going to be delayed and this was going to take its place. And so far from what I've seen from the trailers, it looks fantastic. Yeah. It looks funny. The, my only concern is, are, are they showing too much? Are they showing too many of the jokes? Because I like all the jokes mm -hmm. that I've seen so far. Even this one, the one with the with the Joker and the villain thing <laughs> about how he has different villains and you know making a parallel to dating. Yeah. He's like, oh, I have different villains around. Um, so I, I like all that stuff. My only concern is, I hope they're not showing everything. You know, mm -hmm. like like there's still jokes left in the film right and, and, and batman was one of the standouts in the original lego movie so doing this movie next uh, makes sense yeah uh Sinead, uh you saw the trailer what do you think um i liked it you know it's still not my favorite trailer that i've seen so far i think that first one is still my favorite but it's really good i do agree with you that it seems like we're getting a lot um but i that doesn't make me nervous about it too much because i feel like this movie is just going to be so funny from beginning to end and what i have seen i love like there i have no criticism towards movie mm. but i do think like all right it's enough now like i don't need any more trailers <laughs> i loved what i've gotten i would have been happy with just the first one honestly because i thought the first one was so so good um but i mean i'm super excited when does it come out february i forgot the exact 17? date yeah, Did I yeah. so up? i feel maybe. like we'll probably still pro maybe get, get another, another trailer, trailer yeah mm -hmm. um wendy what do you think I loved it. I thought it was really funny, which is complete opposite of what I said during when we saw the Comic Con trailer. And I think that day I just kind of had an overload of <laughs> a lot of trailer reactions. But this one's really funny. I'm taking a more a bit of a liking more to the Robin character. And uh, same with you and Sinead. Uh, I just hope that they're not showing us all the jokes already, putting all their cards on the table. But I am looking forward to this, and I'm ready for Batman Lego. All right. All right. What's uh, up first? 
According to The Hollywood Reporter, Columbia Pictures is rebooting the 1997 film Starship Troopers, tapping the screenwriting duo of Mark Swift and Damian Shannon to pen the script with an eye towards making the movie a franchise starter. The outlet also reports that the studio is not remaking the film, but instead will be going back to the original Robert A. Heinlein novel for its source material. Paul Verhoeven and the original cast and crew are not involved. Dennis, what do you think about a Starship Troopers reboot? Uh, I'm apprehensive about this because <laughs> I love the first one, the Starship Troopers, the one that uh, Paul Verhoeven directed. I love the tone of it. I like the kind of humorous and satirical look at nationalism and militarism. I don't know if that's going to happen in, in, in this version. You have a screenwriting duo who, who's taking on Baywatch, which we haven't seen yet, but we know that's going to be kind of a comedy and probably more raunchy one. We don't know if it's funny yet or not. But then you have the producer... One of the producers also produced the remake of Total Recall, which was also directed by Paul Verhoeven, and took out the tone of that completely and changed changed that. So I'm I'm, I'm nervous about it. I, I feel like the, the original, I don't know how they're going to improve on the original. I know the visual effects will be better. They'll, they'll probably make it more action-oriented. But in terms of the humor and the satirical look at it, I, I don't know. Perry? I'm nervous for this movie, <laughs> but I could not be more excited. <laughs> Looking at when that image came up, I just couldn't stop staring at it and smiling. I love the original Starship Troopers movie so, so much, but I will say I've never read the book, and when the Starship Troopers movie came out, I was pretty young, so when I when I was first introduced to that movie, I was introduced to it as like a funny and crazy alien fighting movie. That's what I appreciated about it. Now that I'm much older and I could look at the satire and understand it, I do get what it is, but still to me, for, for the sake of nostalgia, it's still like a crazy action movie mm -hmm. to me. So I'm a little nervous by the quote of, you know, this not being a straightforward remake of the movie, but rather a reboot of the original novel, because I know that doesn't play with the satire mm, right. really, really at all. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've ever read it, Roka, yeah. but I know that movie, that book does not do what the movie does really at all. But yeah. the thought of having a brand new Starship Troopers movie, I like, dear God, I really hope, and these guys also wrote uh, Freddy vs. Jason and the, uh, the Friday the 13th reboot from 2009. And you know, those do have heightened fun vibes to them mm -hmm. to a point at least. But I think if we can have fun maybe make the, the action a little more visceral and real and gritty. I, I think there could be a nice mix there. So just curious to see who they find to direct at this point, because that I think is going to give us a better sense of the tone. Roka. Okay, this is interesting to me. As a person who enjoys the film, uh, it's, okay, <laughs> it's cool. It does what it's supposed to do. And yes, it had nice themes, and, and it really explored some stuff in a subversive way, which you would not expect for what a what 90s films were like at that time. It really was out of step for what people were. And people just came in initially and just watched it and enjoyed the cheesiness yes. of it. But then later, it, when they came out with these analysis, some mm. really intelligent film critics took it and broke it down. It was really fantastic to see the effect that it had. So the th I'm, I'm with you, Dennis. I'm worried that they're going to do to this what they did to Total Recall, which is remove what they were trying to what those movies were trying to show and uh, about our society and about our world and just replace it and make them standard action films and then you, then you're like okay great we just just created a franchise and you're going to make money but you're going to lose the reason why people have such a, such a nostalgia for those films why they were eminently rewatchable because of what they were saying about our society at the time and the way they did it and even the cheesy uh, special effects at times were great I mean, and Dina Meyer should get a shout out because Dina Meyer was great in those films i loved her in that in that film and so there's there's so much there's if they take away the joy of the film the reason why people love it then i think there's certainly a danger but that being said swift and shannon may be coming like the lord and miller of this kind of thing where they're coming in and they're rebooting franchises in a certain way that that are interesting and fun and just and just as uh, just as just as keeping with the tone of the originals and that would be great if they do that because we have to see how baywatch turns out baywatch if it turns out to be a fun time yeah. it's still like you know touches on the original a little bit then well then it'll build up more confidence for this but i know a lot of people love this film so if they mess this up they're really like stepping on a lot of people's toes yeah i think seeing baywatch <laughs> and seeing how that comes out is yeah. going to be a big indicator and also the director as well mm. who are they going to hire is it yes. are they going to hire a straightforward standard action director like they did with the total recall mm -hmm. or are they actually going to find someone that, that can have a little more fun with it yeah joe cornish huh? he should direct it okay. the guy who directed attack the block oh yeah how how good of an example is that of like a oh, fun monster alien invasion movie absolutely yeah.
Or so someone like a Matthew Vaughn who had fun with yeah. with Kick Ass. That's right. another Men, good option. Yeah. Were, and then hopefully, uh, you know, I, the original was rated R, if, I, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm worried that this is going to be some sort of PG-13 and just yeah. straight up, you know, action film. And all, most of these guys are all still around, and so they can all make cameos in the film. What, like uh, Neil Patrick Harris, yeah. Casper Van Dien. I, uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure Casper Van Dien is not doing anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I interviewed him at, uh, at Comic-Con oh, for, uh, for Nerd HQ. And, of course, Denise Richards, yeah. And so Casper is still... On point. I think he did. Didn't he appear in some of the the sequels they had? Like yes. the director. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sure he he'd be happy to do it. God, I'm I used sure to have such a crush on him. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next topic. <laughs> a little longer for the adaptation of Stephen King's The Dark Tower. According to EW, Sony has pushed back the release from February 17th, 2017, to July 28th, 2017. Principal photography wrapped on schedule in late July, but the plan to have the full feature ready to screen six months later turned out to be overly ambitious. Sources for EW say it was a matter of needing a deadline extension for visual effects and more lead up time to promote the film. Roka, do you think giving The Dark Tower more time for visual effects is a good thing for the movie in the long run? Yeah, absolutely. I think also moving it to that time frame in the summer is really smart. And I think it actually shows confidence in the film, confidence in what they're making, confidence in what they're doing, that it's going to make the money and be worth a summer slate or summer positioning. And what what I think is good is that you're, you're, you're taking the time because this the first book came out in 82, right? The first people were starting to talk about making a film of this back in 2007 with J.J. Abrams. So this has been a long journey in going to and bringing this thing to life. So if you want to take a little bit more time so you get the visual effects right, you get that stuff that's supposed to happen in the film, the metaphysical stuff, the supernatural stuff, it's it's like the beginning of a multiverse for Stephen King. Like this is essentially could be launching an entire franchise, a whole entire property, if they go forward with these series of books. Oh, sorry, then there's so much to explore here to do it. So to me, I think it's a good thing that they're taking a little bit more time. And I do think the studio is kind of maybe not telling us the truth hmm. about moving it to the summer. It's a way to kind of cover their tracks and make it seem like as if they have more faith in the film. I actually think it's a good thing as well because mm. they need to polish up those visual effects. And yeah. it was very ambitious for them to try and kind of shoot and edit and, and do the post on this movie within within a year yeah. when they ramp this up. I mean, this this project has gone through so many iterations now i don't even know are they still doing that they're going to do a movie and a tv show and a right. this and that I, i'm not too sure look visual effects are not going to make or break a movie in terms of like whether it's good or not however an extra polish to it especially for a movie like this that takes you into a different world mm. you don't want the viewer to watch the film and then look at something like you know like x-men origins wolverine those visual effects were terrible right you don't want the audience to be like start looking at at those little elements and take them out of the film. I haven't read the books, but I know like it, it, it's gonna. It's very important for the for the viewer to feel like they they're in a different kind of dimension or era. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you guys. Obviously, more time could mean a better movie, and mm-hmm. I think that's the most important thing of all. Looking at this, though, I'm a little surprised. I'm a little surprised and not surprised at the same time because all throughout the summer, I feel like it was from July to September, there was tons of images Mm -hmm. and quotes dropping about this. And I mean official quotes from people involved, not just someone saying they heard this. So I thought that they were really ramping up to drop a trailer Mm -hmm. and make that release date. But, you know, given the fact that it's November and we haven't seen any footage, it was pretty obvious that this was coming. I'm more curious about what this means for for the studio because this is uh, is Sony, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Sony. 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 So now with this moving, I think Sony only has one movie coming out in February, Patient Zero, and I don't believe we've seen a trailer for that. No. So that makes me a little concerned. Mm-hmm. And this is going to be an enormous summer, and I don't know if the fan base for the Dark Tower books is going to be enough to overtake everything else that it's going to be competing against because mm-hmm. that is a, a dangerous spot to be in the end of uh, the end of July because you got cause even with Sony's own stuff you have Spider-Man coming out at the beginning of the month and mm-hmm. next weekend is War for the Planet of the Apes the weekend after that it's Dunkirk and Valerian and then it's the Dark Tower versus an untitled Disney fairy tale movie wow yeah. that's just it's not going to be easy I, I hope this movie is the greatest thing ever I'm really looking forward to it I love the cast and everything but 
Good yeah. luck, Sony. You got you got your work cut out for you. Well, and the other thing is this, this they're saying it's not an adaptation, it's a sequel to the books. Oh, okay. So they're asking the audience to read the books before <laughs> they walk into the movie theater. Maybe that's so, why they pushed it back yeah, so we can have all the time to yeah, read to, the massive, massive make, books. They should put that on the movie post. <laughs> Please read the books before you walk in. Yeah, you, it's really important. Anytime you do that, suddenly the box office is just gonna start yeah, oh, exactly. dropping. Right. And that's what I worry about the film is because they're asking so much of that from the audience. I mean, obviously they'll have flashbacks and they'll give you exposition. Yeah. No, no self respecting studio would not do that so they're going to do that but if he's already going to have the horn of Elden what then what is what is how are we going to get to the journey of what he's going to do next and then what worlds are they choosing from the series of books to go into so this may be why they're pushing it because they want to have more time to flesh out those worlds a little bit more so that people who are coming in who haven't read the books will be able to attach themselves to it and follow the journey well I think books. Perry makes a good point though because I don't think something because based on when we do kind of news stories and cover the Dark Tower, it, there's isn't a huge. I know there's like a rabid fan base that love those those book series, but right. in, in general for the casual audience, they're not too familiar with this, or or they super excited. So maybe even like having that February release date, even without the visual effects, that's a bit early because they haven't pushed mm -hmm. any marketing through mm -hmm. and, and they haven't gotten people to understand it. And that was the, the whole thing with something like Deadpool. Yeah. Deadpool was something, even though I still argue with people today, he was not well known in in the general movie going audience, yeah. but because how good that marketing campaign was and introduced who the character was, what he looked like, what his tone was, how he behaved, and all those things. That's something Dark Tower needs to do to to, to kind of inform and educate the potential movie-going audience. Because yeah. if they drop, let's say in February, with whatever, you know, obviously they would have some sort of marketing between between now and then. I don't know if that would be enough. Yeah. But you give yourself some time if it's all the way in July. Maybe they'll push it back further to like mid-August when there's maybe less competition. I wouldn't be all that surprised if that happened. Mm. I actually think they probably would have been better off from a box. Eh, maybe, maybe I'm lying. Actually, there's a lot. In, God, 2017 mm -hmm. is a huge freaking year. They got to make up for 2016. The That's difference, why. the major difference between this and like a Deadpool is, even though Deadpool wasn't as well known as maybe other superheroes, it was still a superhero movie yes. that was going to yeah. get butts and seats no matter what. And I, I don't want to speak, generalize and speak for everyone out there, but I, I'd like to bet if you pulled 10 people off the street, only you know half if that would tell you what kind of movie the dark tower oh, is yeah, oh I, no less, less, than, less, than, less than half i was gonna probably. say but, I mean, probably not even that much deadpool. Yeah. i was always arguing with people about deadpool. guardians if of the you, galaxy if you, yeah. yeah if you Man, went on the street and asked people show them yeah. a picture of deadpool yeah. they'd be like oh that's like spider-man's cousin or something right. like that they, they wouldn't know i mean obviously the younger people who play video games read comic books right. would know but the general audience know well what and i think the opening special effects of deadpool really enhanced people's enjoyment of the film immediately yeah so if if i think that's a smart move to take a little bit of time because that will anchor the people in the into the film and enjoy the film even more. Yeah. All right, guys. Now we're moving on to buy or sell. Sinead, what do we got first? Lionsgate has released a new La La Land trailer. Damien Chazelle's follow-up to Whiplash centers on two dreamers living in modern-day Los Angeles. Mia, played by Emma Stone, an aspiring actress who can't land a gig, and Sebastian, played by Ryan Gosling, a pianist who wants to open his own jazz club. The pair eventually fall for each other, but their careers are tested when their relationship becomes an obstacle to seeing their dreams come true. The film opens in select cities on December 9th. Perry, do you buy or sell the new trailer for La La Land? That's a silly question. I love <laughs> <laughs> I have a problem. I can't stop watching these trailers. I can't stop watching them. The only thing that's going to make me smile as big as thinking about Casper Van Dien in this show <laughs> is thinking about the La La Land trailer. It's so freaking good. And just, you know, I've seen the movie. Full that's, disclosure. Full yeah. disclosure yeah. there. I've, I've seen the movie. It's fantastic. It has officially topped Green Room as my number one movie of the year. Wow. It's it's really it's touching, it's meaningful, it's fun. I mean, Damien Chazelle really just set the bar so much higher. If you thought Whiplash was good, wait until you see what he accomplishes in this movie. But the La La Land promotional campaign in general is a perfect example of a trailer of a campaign that is not spoiling the movie while showing you so much about it at the same time. Because right. if you look at all the trailers that came out, they're essentially just repurposing all of the imagery they've already showed you, but mm -hmm. they're taking the songs and they're just showing you the different tones that the movies are gonna hit through the songs. And this latest one is probably the thing that I think most accurately represents the movie as a whole. So if you go back, it's, you know, there's one song that's a little more somber, another that focuses particularly on Emma Stone's character. And now this one is, mm -hmm. it gives you a very good 
general overview of what you're going to get from the movie as a whole. Rocco? Yeah, I don't I've got know a, what's happening. No, uh, um, one of our productions there. Uh, <laughs> let out a noise. Uh, when I, 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 <laughs> now it got awkward. I, now we go. No, I, to me, this is what's interesting about La La Land. La La Land seems to be a, a continuation. Everyone says I love you had vibes of this. Punch Drunk Love has vibes of this. In fact, the color scheme in the trailers is very reminiscent of what we see in the transition scenes in Punch Drunk Love. The, the, the purples and the blues kind of coming together in a background. So to me, this seems like a, a continuation of that, like a connection or a combination of those two. And it makes me excited because this looks like to be the best of those three films. And it looks to me like this is going to be something that will rev like affect people in a way that like Eternal Sunshine did. And I think that is what I'm looking forward to. And I think we've had articles already, like, this morning I read an article from Sean Fennessy on The Ringer and he talked about how adult films don't like they, they, they have to fight to get through the, all the stuff that's going on now and I think films like this need to have their chance to exist so to me I buy this uh, this trailer so much because it gives you that vibe of like yes it's taking advantage of the medium itself and pushing the boundaries of the medium at the same time while also tr it looks like telling you a very uh, mature adult love story that can happen with the magic and the reality. So Yeah, I buy the trailer as well. It gives more insight into what the actual story is because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the previous trailers kind of gave you more of the tone and vibe, and this one gives you the story of who Emma Stone's character is, who Ryan Gosling's character is, and how they relate to each other. I love the look and feel of it. It has obviously a classic Hollywood feel to it because of the musical, the way it looks, but also a modern look as well it kind of combines those two well damien chazelle with with whiplash that was a fantastic mm, film yeah. obviously has a thing for for music in general that yeah. he you know he's so talented i mean i really cannot stop humming and singing and these songs are just so stuck in my head at this wow. point and it's great it's great is the soundtrack out I don't know if it's available. Oh, it's available I've right? just been listening to whatever's in these trailers <laughs> over and over <laughs> and over fair. again. But when the soundtrack does come out, it's yeah. going right in the collection yeah. this year with Sing Street because yeah. Oh, yeah. Those, those two movies, I mean, what a year for musicals. Those are two special, special movies. People do not talk about Sing Street enough. No, we talked about it on a on a mailbag, and Did we got you? actually yeah. we actually got a lot of tweets. People telling yeah. us, "Hey, we, I checked out this movie because you guys mentioned it," mm -hmm. and, they, and a lot of them loved it. Drive people, it. Drive people it like keep you asking to compare La La Land to Sing Street, oh. which I don't think is possible right. because they're two completely different types yeah. of movies. But again, there's another double feature for you. Yeah. Watching those two back to back, it's just like the most wonderful music filled afternoon you could ever have. Yeah, and you can only get that watching a movie like that. Those movies like that really capture that joy of it. You know, and Drive It Like You Stole It should have been mm. the jam of the summer. It never broke through, <laughs> and it should have been because that's an awesome song. Yeah, and not enough people saw Sing Street. Yeah. So. Hopefully, a lot more people see La La Land just because this has stars in it. The Sing Street didn't like; no, they weren't going to market no. that thing. But, but yeah. there's also no doubt in my mind that La La Land will be front and center when award season starts. Mm. You know, when we start hearing about nominations and everything, because there's no doubt in my mind this thing will get a Best Picture nomination. No doubt in my mind that Emma Stone will get a Best Actress nomination. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I've I haven't seen everything, so it's you can't really judge or make predictions but at this point in the year I'm rooting for her yeah. she is really good in this movie do you think Ryan and Emma are like our I don't know what you'd compare them to other uh, eras of film stars where they work together a lot as a couple you know they kind of work I don't know I mean they, the were, they, were, they had good chemistry and crazy stupid love they did. but oh, Gangster Squad Gangster was, Squad. was, yeah, was yeah, a dud <laughs> you know but that probably was, that wasn't their fault that movie was just a, yeah <laughs> Everyone's, everyone was emoting in that film and acting yeah. all weird it's no good yeah. yeah but this this looks like a you know real yeah. take a, like a next step of crazy stupid love yeah Sinead uh, you saw the trailer what do you think I wrote on Facebook this morning that the trailer gives me goosebumps. And I feel like this was the first trailer where I, I, I feel like I, I get their relationship a little bit more. And mm. that excites me because every thing that I've seen the two of them together, I, I fall for them. Like I always fall for their chemistry. I think it's so good. And I've been itching for a musical. I haven't seen Sing Street, but as soon as Perry started oh. talking about La La Land, yeah. I was like, oh, yes, because I don't absolutely love musicals where I, I don't want to watch them all the time, but I need one or two or three really good ones a year. Mm -hmm. And I'm so stoked on this. This looks so good. Is this the second trailer? Yeah, I think it's okay, the second so trailer. I think there's there's two two teasers maybe. Yeah. Yes. And then this one full trailer. This is the one full trailer. So the only other thing I've seen was that very first tease, which kind of showed you nothing. It was just like 
painting the scene a little bit. She's singing. That alone, I was like, this looks awesome. Mm -hmm. But now I feel like getting into the story a little bit, I am so excited. The two of them just make me so happy. They give me the warm and fuzzies all over my body. <laughs> I'm so stoked on this, you guys. Like, I cannot wait for December. Wendy, are you on this La La Land train as well? Oh, this movie already has my ticket. The musical theater geek in me is so happy. The last uh, musical theater or musical movie that I saw that gave me the feels, I, I think, was The Last Five Years with Anna Kendrick. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. I think this one, I am. it's like uh, all my friends who have already seen it at uh, various uh, festivals are raving about this. My expectation is very high, but I don't think I'm going to be let down. In fact, I know I'm going to get this on the Blu-ray. All, right. hmm. all right, what's next? Sony has released the first full T2 Train Spotting International trailer. Danny Boyle's sequel reunites Renton, played by Ewan McGregor, plus Spud, Sick Boy, and Begbie. And while they're no longer addicted to heroin, it looks as though their lives haven't gotten any easier. T2 Train Spotting opens in the UK on January 27th, 2017, followed by a limited US release on March 3rd. Dennis, you buy or sell the first trailer for T2 Train Spotting. Okay, I'm going to buy the trailer, but I don't like that they're calling it T2. There is only mm. one T2, <laughs> and that's Terminator 2. So l let's let's get away from calling it that. I know yesterday in the chat room, talk about T2, talk about T2. I'm like, what? Terminator 2? We're, we're talking about the old the James Cameron film, one of the best action films of all time? No. So, but as far as the trailer is concerned. <laughs> I haven't I, seen you so hyped up about yeah. something in a while. Hey, wow. T2. <laughs> Don't leave that alone. Anyways, I mean, it's all right. Yeah. Train spotting. I, I, I liked the film when it came out. It's not my favorite Danny Boyle film. I know a lot of people, it, it's their favorite Boyle film. But I really like this trailer. It almost had a vibe to me of a newer version of Fight Club, where he's talking about the social media. He's mm. talking about Facebook, Instagram. He's talking about addiction. He's talking about distractions. And there's kind of a theme in that within a Fight Club. Fight Club. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, this this is a bit buy. Perry, I will buy it. Uh, I'm like you. This is not my favorite Danny Boyle movie. I respect the fact that other people love it, but I was not in a position where I'm like, I need a Train Spotting sequel. No. And I like what I see in this trailer. It's not again. It's not changing my mind to say, oh, I'm dying to see a sequel to the first movie. And the one negative, the one pretty major negative thing I could say about this trailer is that this trailer to me feels like fan service. It's like, welcome back to the characters. Let's kind of see where you're making faces already. <laughs> let's, see, let's see the situation they're, on, they're in now. I can't imagine the large majority of people who are not already into the first train spotting movie seeing this trailer and being like, yeah, I'm going to watch that and maybe watch the first as well. Mm -hmm. Roka? Uh, <laughs> you're both insane. <laughs> this this film is fantastic. Coming. Danny Boyle, this is the film that, these are one of these seminal films that I watched at a certain age where I was like, yes, I want to be in, I want to be an actor. I want to be a film director. I want to be in the business. This is one of those films that hit me at a certain time and it has always been one that I come back to every time because of what they were showing. And I think it's Danny at his hungriest as a director. Much like I feel with Tarantino, Reservoir is his hungriest. Mm -hmm. And so these things, so this to me is, a, is, is, is one of these film, seminal films in the history, especially in the 90s when independent films were happening, you know? So I have to express how much love, certain people like Riley and I were talking about it before, how much love we have for train spotting. So to me, this looks fantastic. And I buy this trailer so much because for the exact opposite reasons, I think it doesn't look like a cash grab at all. I think it doesn't look like a trip to Nostalgia City. I think it's more a matter of a logical continuation of what happens to these characters 20 20 years later. Last time we, we left them, he, he took the money and left them all there in, in Spud and Begbie, all of them in the, in, the, uh, in the room. What happened? We don't know. So now we're going to find out, you know, and he's going back to visit a couple of the characters from before, but now we're going to see. He's, Begbie is older now. He's an old man. Robert Carlyle mm. is old. It's like, wow, it's just amazing. So what, and Ewan McGregor still looks the same, so what are we going to do with that? So there's so much more here that I think they're going to explore, and the novel is fantastic that it's based on, so that is what I'm looking forward yeah, to. Yeah, I don't well. think it's a cash grab because there is a, a sequel yeah. book that they're right. basing mm -hmm. this off of. Right. I, that one shot, uh, what, is it Spud that it's falling, falling off, off yes. the building yeah. oh, and then man. he falls in? That's a fantastic yeah. shot. It's it's reminiscent of the when he's going back in the first movie yeah. when he's really getting high and sinks into the floor mm -hmm. or the baby crawling on the oh that you know, creeped all me all that out stuff. that baby yeah. thing. But that's what the movie me. did. Yeah. yeah, it really it kind of woke you up to the drug culture that had kind of been underground for most people. It really showed it on screen, and this looks like it's doing that too. It's showing what's happening here in the modern world, yeah. what we're now so accepting of, 
exploring the possible uh, ramifications of these vices. This is actually the exact opposite of a cash grab when you look yes. at it. This is, this is, to me, a director and the actors from mm -hmm. the original movie truly loving that movie yeah. and appreciating the fan base and wanting to bring this back to them, which which again is why I think it does alienate newcomers or thus, oh, thus far at right. least. But one, right. one of the cool things about a train spotting sequel to me is yeah. Look at all the movies Danny Boyle has directed since that movie. Yeah. There is no doubt in my mind that's going to significantly change the oh, style yeah. that we see in this while still capturing much of the original. But, I mean, he's accomplished so much throughout the years. There's no doubt in my mind that from a directorial standpoint, Trainspotting 2 is going to blow the original out of the water. Perry, just from the trailer, you can tell there's yeah. a more mature filmmaker here. There's The shots are different. The colors are different. The, mm -hmm. the cinematography has a certain kind of style that's more mature more old and yes of course it's supposed to show that because the characters are more mature but it still finds its time to have these like reminiscent moments when they're sliding on the fake grass celebrating because that's an, a soccer moment that's all about being that's all in a high vision you know and so there's still I think it's going to be a good combination of both like the modern and the mm -hmm. and it'll be enough to get us those of us who love the films and love these characters well, I'm still up. Yeah. looking forward to seeing it. I just don't know if I necessarily needed a sequel but I'm, I'm glad that we have one all right what's next the bad news continues for fans of the original Deadpool and its sequel. First came the announcement that Tim Miller would be stepping down as director due to, quote, creative differences. And now Deadpool composer Junkie XL, a.k.a. Tom Holkenberg, announced via social media that he would be departing as well. Roka, do you buy or sell the exit of Junkie XL on Deadpool 2? This is a difficult question. Do I buy or sell? Am I buying or selling that? Him leaving. Him leaving. So yeah. I'm buying it like it's a good thing that he's left? Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I buy it. It's a good thing that he's left. I think, I think this is people love Tim Miller. I, I, I once again, not to make a reference to it, but I interviewed him at uh, Nerd HQ at Comic Con. That guy immediately just, I felt a connection to him immediately, like, like alpha male to alpha male, and he seemed like a cool dude, like you'd want to work with him. So I think he has a very strong stable of people that he brought together to bring Deadpool to life, and to see him leaving you see the loyalty these people have to him. So I think this is a good thing. And it is a loss. I mean, and we, and we should have seen this coming uh, because he's done, he's doing Justice League. He just, he's going to do Dark Tower, which we mentioned earlier in the show. Batman vs. Superman. He did Deadpool, Black Mass, Mad Max Free Road, Run All Night, 300 Rise of an Empire. This is the developing you know, this is a dribbling composer who's being bigger and bigger projects, and to lose him on this project, I think, is another blow to Deadpool too. And it kind of it makes it makes it more and more shaky. I think people's reaction of like they really got to do something amazing here to save it. And Ryan could go like this, and then go right back down again if this thing doesn't work out. Well, I buy Junkie XL leaving and yeah. his loyalty to Tim Miller, yeah. but I do sell the fact that it's going to affect this production that much. Just because, look, I love Junkie XL. Mm -hmm. I think that Mad Max Fury road soundtrack it was amazing he worked with hans zimmer on the batman v superman mm -hmm. i don't know who came up with that wonder woman theme but yeah. that thing is a fantastic but deadpool everyone remembers the pop songs from it everyone mm. remembers salt and pepper shoop everyone remembers angel in the morning people remember those pop songs versus the score in deadpool mm -hmm. don't get me wrong he's made some fantastic music deadpool just wasn't the one that stood out to me so mm -hmm. i think him leaving doesn't impact it as much um perry yeah i'm pretty much with you i mean i kind of have to buy it because he's doing it and it's better for him to just leave if he felt that strongly about working with tim miller i mean if he just stuck to it because he felt obligated to it yeah. i think that could have hurt the movie mm -hmm. Him leaving, I I don't think it's going to be a quality issue pretty much for the exact reasons Dennis just said. And if they do wind up getting the John Wick director, who I think is a fantastic replacement for Tim Miller, even though I would have preferred Tim Miller mm -hmm. sticking with the project than them all living happily ever after still. <laughs> but I think they're going to find a great substitute, and I don't think this is going to hurt the movie at all. In general, I mean, I'm just sad because Deadpool wasn't just special because it was a really fantastic movie with a great marketing campaign. It was the story behind it, yeah. the, the underdog story and how these guys just, you know, band together and they stuck with it and they fought for it together. And now and now this family is falling apart and it, it just makes me sad. Mm -hmm. It makes me sad to see yeah. something something that special a collaborative relationship that was that strong and worked that well be torn apart over creative issues or industry issues or whatever the real issues behind the situation is. So I, I'm still looking forward to Deadpool 2, 
I'm just a little bummed by what's happening. I, I think that's the dangerous thing, in my opinion, is people love people. A lot of people feel that opinion or, or share that opinion, Perry. They they love the story behind Deadpool. They love the result of the film so much. I mean, I saw it again the other night on H because it's showing on HBO. I stayed up to 1 a.m. the other night watching it again because it's so good. People have a love for this thing. And this just makes it all the more of an uphill climb for the sequel to reach that kind of love again when you take away the original people who were involved in it. It just it just makes it harder, and I think that's my concern about the sequel going forward. All right, All right uh, let's move on to the next one. According to THR, Olivia Munn is in negotiations to join Bo- Boyd Holbrook in The Predator, 20th Century Fox's reboot directed by Shane Black. While there aren't many solid details on the plot, THR does reveal that the titular alien hunter will set its sights on suburbia this time around. Munn will play a scientist opposite Holbrook's Special Forces Commando. A February start date is scheduled with a release date set for February 9th, 2018. Perry, do you buy or sell The Predator taking place in the suburbs with Olivia Munn as a scientist? Oy. There, there's a lot. Of, there, there's a lot of mixed mixed feelings there. I think I'm gonna have to buy it overall, just because I'm so excited about this movie, and most of all, I'm curious about the suburbia part of it because, you know, Predator. They, they belong in the jungle. They they hunt in the jungle. I'm really curious to see how that hunt is going to take place in a suburban neighborhood. I mean, yeah. it sounds more to me like a pure horror movie. I'm I'm kind of picturing at this point the purge but with with predators instead of instead of purgers and as for Olivia Munn I mean fine what whatever I I'm not her biggest fan I can't really name a movie I've seen where I'm like she brought a lot to that role good for her but I also really haven't seen her in in any movies where I think the role was that great either so I can't really blame her and I've also never seen the newsroom so Mm -hmm. I hear she's great in that I, I guess I guess by yay for suburbia though I'm curious mm-hmm. All right, I'm gonna keep my comments short because I know Roka's over there about uh, to like no, burst no. over there <laughs> yeah. um, I'm gonna sell it just because I thought they were gonna take this kind of back to the jungle I thought they were gonna we know that Arnold is gonna have a cameo I thought they were gonna run into him in the jungle and he had been living there and survived maybe just my own thoughts <laughs> of what the movie should have been mm-hmm. look I I like Shane Black. I like the movies he's written. I like the movies he's directed. I trust him. So both in the setting of Suburbia and him casting Olivia Munn, there must be a reason that he, why he's doing it. Olivia Munn is not a person that I, I find like, oh, I, I, I don't hate her. Mm-hmm. I think she works in certain roles, something like a newsroom. Uh, I think she was on New Girl as well. But then there's other things like Psylocke in the yeah. latest X-Men movie where it looks like, I don't know for a fact, it just looks like they cut around her performance mm-hmm. in that. And maybe there's just certain roles that aren't suited for her. But I, I trust Shane Black. Maybe whatever role he's written for her, maybe that fits. Roka? Yeah, here's the thing. Well, all right. So they're going to remake it. They're going to put it in suburbia. This is really tough for me. I get that it's. I'm super happy it's Shane Black coming back because, like you said, Dennis, I, I'm a massive fan of Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Nice guys. Like I, I, I love that Shane Black is getting an opportunity to do a big studio film again. Mm-hmm. Like so he earned his. He, he can't climb back. He's earned his spot. So I'm. I'm a big fan of this idea. It, I trust him that he's going to do the right thing with this property and with this character and and put it in suburbia it seems weird because they tried that in predator 2 to put it in the city and it really didn't work (laughs) so that scares me a little bit but i trust shane black do i buy olivia munn as a scientist absolutely not (laughs) and i'm and this is nothing like you like perry said in certain things yes certain things no dennis you said that too so, there is not anything that I've seen her do that is amazing or cataclysmic or great as an actress. She's she's certainly palatable. She's certainly acceptable in certain roles. But the reason people crow about her in other roles is because she's not so good in other roles. People go, oh, she's great in the newsroom. But then you're like, yeah, you're saying that because in other things, you know secretly inside she hasn't been that great. So it, those, those kinds of things are there with her. So yeah, she'll be fine. She'll put, They'll put the glasses on her and they'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll do all, pull her hair know, back. The glasses and, make yeah, they'll you- do. Yeah, same thing yeah. they do with Megan Fox. You're supposedly smart. Put the glasses on her. Put the hair back. You know, those kinds of things. You see that happen. Those are st- at standard fare. Mm-hmm. She sells tickets, and there's nothing wrong with that. People find Does her attractive. She? Yeah, people find her attractive. They go to see her. So I don't think that's a negative, but... You, let's not, you know, let's not be, let's not be stupid about it. Like we, she, it's, it's what's supposed to happen here. It makes sense. She's, she fits, 
and she's not going to take away from the main character. That's the smart casting choice too. She's not going to overshadow the main character. She's going to facilitate I feel like what's that's happening. Such a backhanded here. compliment. Well, <laughs> listen, you're not going to ruin the movie. <laughs> Good for you. Well, you're not going to ruin it. Listen, reality is reality. You know, some people are put in positions because they don't overshadow. You know, they, that's all involved in casting. I have a few friends who are casting directors. Look, you're directors. not that good. I'm but like you're not gonna this ruin on her resume now. <laughs> it's like you cast me if you want to highlight your main man. Yeah. If you I'm don't not want someone that doesn't kind of doesn't overshadow yeah. everyone else. You can cast me. Listen, I'd, I'd be happy to have a resume. So, uh, you know, what am I talking about? I'd love to make the movies that she makes. But, like, you have to understand, this is what she does. I think you would have made a great Psylocke. Thank you. <laughs> well, put well, me that, that one. Yeah, you just put that image in my <laughs> head. And now, now. I, I... Let me show my butt Sorry. cheeks. Hello. Oh, yeah. All right, here we go. Is that too far, Dennis? Yes. Yeah, All too right. far. All right, let's move on to the last by ourselves so I can get that image. Don't out objectify of my mind. me. A new trailer has been released for Office Christmas Party. Jennifer Aniston stars as a no-nonsense CEO who's planning to shut down her brother's local branch. So he, played by T.J. Miller, and his co-workers enact a plan to throw a massive holiday party and impress a client. The film also stars T.J. Miller, Kate McKinnon, and Jason Bateman, and it opens in theaters on December 9th, 2016. Dennis, do you buy or sell the new trailer for Office Christmas Party? I buy it. I was already sold on this movie from the first trailer I saw. This one actually gives a little more story and context of who everyone is. This one actually shows that Jennifer Aniston and T.J. Miller are brother and sister. They show that Courtney B. Vance is actually a client they're trying to... Because in the first one, it was just mad craziness. Mm -hmm. And I just thought all of them were there just to party. And there seems to be a really strange and far-fetched idea that somehow throwing the biggest party is going to make this guy want to, you know, sign up his millions of dollars to their company. But, you know, it's, it's a comedy. We're not there for, for realistic stories. We're there, you know, for, for jokes. And f so far, what I've seen, it, it looks pretty funny. Harry? I'm going to buy it strictly because Olivia Munn's in it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> for and how, how long is she in the trailer? Oh, know. 15 seconds. Yeah. Um, no, but I buy, I buy this trailer. This looks like a fun movie to have come out during Christmas. And I can't really say there's anything in the trailer that looks to me... Like, I wasn't dying of laughter at any one moment. And there were a couple things that felt a little cliche, but I really like the energy of it. I like the content. I like the idea of an office Christmas party. And how can you really turn down this ensemble? So I am keeping my hopes super high that the funniest jokes were not in this trailer. But still, it's not like I didn't like the trailer either. Mm -hmm. I still had fun with it. And I, I can't wait to see it. Roca. Oh yeah, I couldn't be more excited about this. I, I didn't know what to expect before I watched it, and when I watched it, I had so much fun, so much fun, because I thought it was going to be like horrible bosses, you know, because of Jennifer Aniston being in it. I thought it was going to be one of these kind of like off, off comedies that aren't quite as funny as people think they are. Um, but it was very remin reminiscent of the night before, and very yes. reminiscent mm -hmm. of was it Project X that class that where they threw that yeah, huge yeah. party. Yeah, yeah. So to me, if you get the right people involved in a party movie because people naturally love a party then I think you have a good time in the theater and this looks, looks like it's going to be a lot of fun and I love that they, ca they cast Courtney B. Vance this is an African American actor who doesn't get a lot of shots in these kinds of movies and I think it's great to cast him in it because he is mostly known for playing serious roles yeah but after OJ uh, mm -hmm. people that, versus yeah, OJ he's yeah. going to blow up people uh, are going to yeah. start casting him a lot more finally stuff. in his 50s he's going to blow up yeah I mean he's, that's, that's the how thing. it is yeah, that's I know, I know. especially when you're a minority it's real tough sometimes but I'm happy that he's in this film but it seems to me that we're seeing some new and new comedians in this film too like yeah, the Jillian the, Bell yeah, yeah the taxi there. driver whoever she is she was hilarious in that in the little sequence she has so those things I think will make it make it so much fun and T.J. Miller needs to have one of these films that really kind of he has a great time in you know and he was good in Deadpool and now we want to see what he can do in this you know yeah all right, uh, now we're on to box office predictions. This is the se our segment on Friday where we talk about what the top five movies will be at the box office. This is brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Roka, why don't you start off okay. with your top five? Uh, obviously, I have Doctor Strange number one. I don't know how anybody couldn't. Uh, I have Trolls at two. Hacksaw Ridge at number three, which I really hope gets up there. You know, number four. Boo, a Medea Halloween is killing. I mean, it's killing it. I'm probably going to go this weekend. I'm not lying. I'm probably okay. going to go. And uh, and I think Inferno, which logically didn't make a lot of money, is not going to make a lot of money. It just uh, This franchise has to kind of go away by now. And I think that'll be fifth. Uh, but my number is, I would, mm, 80. So Doctor, yeah, Doctor Str we're doing a tiebreaker yeah. again for Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, you're going 80? 88 million. 88. Yeah, that's what I well, think. Then. I think people. I think okay. it's getting a lot of buzz and people are super excited. And a majority of the reviews that have already come out on Twitter and on Rotten Tomatoes are 
positive about the okay. film. My, my list is similar to yours. I obviously, Doctor Strange number one, Trolls number two, Hacksaw Ridge three, but I switched four and five from mm. you. Mm. I put Inferno at four and I put Boo, <laughs> Boo at number five. Why are you uh, hating on Medea, man? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess I'll probably pay for it because I discounted uh, that movie the other week that we did predictions mm-hmm. and it ended up being number one. You did. I'll give Doctor Strange for the tiebreaker $93 million. Mm, I think it's, wow. it's going to overperform. Uh, Perry? Boo. Ruined my list two weeks in a row. <laughs> I am not So you're putting it at number one then no, this, I, this week. I'm pretty sure back starting at the bottom with four and five, I'm pretty sure Boo and Inferno are going to be pretty damn close, mm, but I'm yeah. giving the edge to Boo just because it's proved me wrong <laughs> so, so bad in the past two weeks. But obviously, number one, I'm going to have Doctor Strange, and I think I'm going to go $83 million. I, th- okay. I think that's a fair number. Uh, Trolls, I think, is going to have a pretty damn good weekend as well. I mean, these were the same. We- this was the same weekend. Peanuts came out last year, and I think mm. Big Hero Six was the year before. Both of those made a lot of money, even though they had a big uh, movie they were facing off against, like with Trolls and Doctor Strange. Peanuts had Spectre, and Big Hero Six, I think, had Interstellar. Mm. Hacksaw Ridge, number three, Boo Four, Inferno Five. All right, uh, Sinead and Wendy, what are your predictions for Doctor Strange's opening weekend? Um, I'm gonna go. I think I'm gonna go a little lower than you guys. I'm gonna say 80 mil. Okay, Wendy. I have it at 95. Okay, so you have the highest. Wow. Do I? Yeah, I nice. have 93. You have 95. Yep. Uh, 88. 83. Yeah, 83, and mm. then you have 80. Okay. All Ooh. right. We'll find out on Monday and see who's right. All right. I uh, just want to remind you guys that we're gonna take live tour questions at the end of the show. You can tweet us at Collider Video. Also, I want to remind you guys, we have a, uh, another show coming up today, every Friday, 2 p.m., Schmodown. Today's show is Jason Inman versus Jeff Schneider, Oof. so be on the lookout for that. We also posted our L.A. Comic Con panel, which was a lot of fun. I know, Roca, you were a part of that. You were a big part of that. Uh, the Outlaw was, yeah. It was a good time. Yeah, there was a lot of surprises. If you haven't checked that out already, it's under the Schmodown playlist on YouTube. You can see all the craziness that happened. It was it was a lot of fun. We also have the Heroes panel from LA Comic Con as well. I also want to remind you, Jeremy Johns, everyone's been asking, when is Jeremy Johns going to be on? Jeremy Johns' debut on Movie Talk as a regular cast member is this Monday. So stay tuned for that. Also, I want to remind you that we got Mailbag this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, and also Best of the Week hosted by Perry Nemiroff. Uh, now we're going on to Mailbag. Sinead, what do we got? Trolls writes, hey, Clyder crew, writing you guys from the 757. I saw that Romeo and Juliet is 20 years old, and I think I heard there is works for a Robin Hood set in modern times. It got me thinking that Robin Hood would be better made as a Western. Outlaw gang, corrupt sheriff, power hunger tyrant, damsel in distress, and so on. I also think King Arthur would be cool set as a samurai movie. So my question is to you guys, what classic story would you like done in a different era or genre? Thanks for taking my question. Keep bringing the filth. P.S. Mark Ellis, you need to come back to the 757 and do your stand-up at one of our comedy clubs. Yeah, this was an interesting question. It's kind of like when they talk about the original Alien that that um, Ridley Scott did that, that was Jaws in space. So taking mm-hmm. a classic story and moving into either a different genre, different setting, different... Um, I always thought uh, All About Eve could be set in a modern-day setting now mm-hmm. using mm-hmm. kind of social media instead of the her Bette Davis being that Broadway star Mm -hmm. having maybe either a YouTube star or Instagram star or something like that and having you know maybe more of a teenage angle to that uh perry what about you uh, mine's a little obvious just because there's so many trailer and scene recuts out there that do this but i want to see the straight horror movie of willy wonka and the chocolate factory oh. there's, if you haven't go google that yeah. and like google the title and then put horror at the end and there's some pretty disturbing stuff that comes i up watched the- one recently it was amazing <laughs> yeah <laughs> just the- recently like a couple weeks ago someone takes the t- takes cuts of it and sets it to it is so well, believable. If you take out certain Willy Wonka quotes and you just listen to them out of context, they're yeah. incredibly alarming. And then I also put, um, I want a super violent Dark Power Rangers movie because of that uh, Adi Shankar yeah. short mm. that he did. I thought, even though I'm very excited for what we're getting and I like the look of it so far, 
I thought there was a lot of potential in what he did with that short, and mm. I kind of want to see more of it. Rocka? Yeah, first of all, shout out 757. That's a Virginia area code, southeastern Virginia. I'm a Virginia boy myself, so that's awesome. Uh, I would say there were rumors about a Hearts of Dar Heart of Darkness in space, which is mm. what we saw in Apocalypse Now. There were rumors about putting that in space. I would have loved to have seen that. Uh, in 2011, they were, there was like talk about making it. Um, but I think 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea could work in space as well. Oh, yeah. But my number one is uh, Three Musketeers remake as a Western. That would be the young gunslinger coming in, the aging gunslingers in the bar, motivating them to do one last, you know, hurrah, one last uh, mission to reawake their love of why they became gunslingers, why they became these Western icons. It would have been great. Like you get wider, you get all these doc, like you get all these people like who were still like, wow, Billy, you could just play around with it and make it work. You know, you don't have to call them obviously D'Artagnan because it's gonna work in the West, <laughs> but you can mess around with the names to make it work. Uh, and shout out to this graphic. I love this graphic. I. I don't know if it's the Arrowhood or the Robin Arrowhood. I don't, but it's really good. I like yeah. it. Yeah, and this, is, this isn't a movie, but we mentioned this book a lot, especially on Jedi Council, which is Lost Stars mm -hmm. is basically oh, yeah. Romeo and Juliet yeah. set in the Star Wars universe. Mm -hmm. and it's done very, very mm -hmm. well. Uh, Sinead, what about you? What kind of a movie, classic story would you like retold in a different genre or setting? Um, so I was thinking like stuff that I grew up on, and one of the things was Aesop's Fables. So I used to have a huge book filled with Aesop's Fables, maybe because... Oh, yeah. My parents are always trying to teach me lessons because I'm such a bad kid. But um, <laughs> I would, so I, I know all of those fables like by heart. So, and I was thinking about this. I would love to see a combination of all of those characters, as a lot of them are animals, and put up on screen in like a sci-fi. And I've been on like Ooh. a robot kick lately, like an AI kick. So I think it would be awesome. You mean robots in is in Pacific Rim, not in Transformers. Oh, right. Right. Is that is that Absolutely. what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't say it, Dennis. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it would be really cool to get all like those animals like animatronics and just put that up on like this big like sci-fi thriller adventure. All right, Sinead DeFries presents Aesop's Fables. Aesop's <laughs> Fables. In space. In space. In space. Robots. In space. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Wendy, what about you? I was thinking more of like a, like a Disney classic that I grew up with, so I thought maybe Pocahontas set in like a Mad Max Fury Road or a Borderland Ooh, type setting. That's cool. Would be kind of cool. And then somebody in the chat room said this, so I wanted to shout out to them. Uh, Diara Harris says, Mean Girls in Victorian times. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, now time to take your live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video. Wendy, what you got up first? Uh, first, I have Andrew Binkley, who writes, do you think Hans Zimmer will do the Uncharted movie score like he did for the video game? Ooh. I'm sure they're going to take elements from yeah. the video game. I mean, since he is a, you know, a movie composer already, it would seem like a natural fit. Mm. Maybe take what he had already done on the series and kind of revamp it and rework it towards what the movie is. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. I mean, I'm, I'm busy looking at his upcoming projects and being like, oh, is, is he too busy? But I look at how many movies this guy scored. Mm. He can mm. definitely squeeze in something else, especially if it's already something he has a pre-established connection to. Yeah, I, it's always nice to revisit something and then enhance it, especially because you're not scoring the game, you're scoring the movie. So there's a whole different uh, uh, things that are asked of you as you go into that, uh, into that project and you can bring elements of what you did in the video game as a shout out to the fans who love the video game, but still do something else with it, yeah. yeah. All right, what's next? Ben Berkowitz writes, what comic book character should get a Lego movie? I think Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles would be perfect. Deadpool. I mean, that just seems <laughs> tailor-made for a Lego movie already. Yeah, I just don't know. I mean, because of what Lego movie is, that, that kind of R-rated, filthy mouth nature. <laughs> I think it would be great but you for just us that. to watch right, it. Of course. I just don't think it would ever happen. You just Do we have that, to Meh. play by the rules, though, like the studio rules? Because obviously it can only be a Warner Brothers appropriate character. Mm. So like, I, oh, good my call. I mean, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles mm. would be cool. My mind went to Star Wars just because of the wealth of Star Wars Lego toys out there and how cool mm. some of those minifigs look, but... That that obviously cannot happen. Well, I think they have an animated. Well, they've already done Lego series. Star Wars. Yeah, uh, there's like a oh, Lego there's animated two of them. television um, series. Oh, I forget what it's called now. I there's the Droid Tales, and then there's Freemaker Adventures. Those Freemaker, are Legos. Yeah, yeah. yeah, those are Lego. I wonder. Things. I just wonder how the rights work to that compared yeah. to what what uh, Warner Brothers is doing with oh, the Lego it's movie. It's all under Disney stuff. Yeah, they allow it to happen, hmm. and the way they they're involved in it and allow it to happen. But yeah. Yeah, I'd like to see X Men. That would be pretty cool. Uh, seeing the whole team having the mansion and all that stuff built in Legos. 
I think Wolverine as the Batman Lego it could be the correlation. If you had a Wolverine Lego, because there's a lot to make fun of. He's you know, constantly trying to find his, who he came from, where he yeah. came from, and you know he's getting in these situations, and he's always drawing his claws too quickly, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. You know? It is an interesting thing to consider with mutants, especially when yeah. they change. It's like now yeah. I'm picturing a Wolverine figure with his claws popping out. I feel like there's tons of great jokes and visual gags to be had with that. With the bub. Bub. All right, uh, what's next? Uh, Roka, I'm really surprised you didn't say Transformers. No. Oh. Even though they're not really comic book, I guess. All right, yeah. next question uh, is, where is your favorite place to get food from after shooting mailbag? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out. Wait, who, is this from a waiter at Wood Ranch? Is no, this from a waiter no. at Wood Ranch? Because uh, <laughs> constantly on the Saturday mailbag, me, Perry, and Sinead. Last week, Perry and Roka ordered Wood, Wood Ranch, Ranch in the middle of shooting <laughs> okay. mailbag. Yeah. Ty, where... I mean, honestly, we don't have time on Friday. Fridays is our, our, our busiest day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a... Wood Ranch. Yeah, Wood Ranch. <laughs> Wood Ranch is the answer. Wood Ranch is the answer. Barbecue chicken salad, yeah. guys. Get on it. So yeah. Either that or the Chipotle, yeah. which is right, right. there, too. You got to put right. the sesame let's, dressing uh, on it, though. Let's do one more. All right, and also, just to clarify, this is from Jonathan G. Ross, who says, actually, Hans Zimmer did not compose the Uncharted game. It was Henry Jackman. Okay. All right, last question comes from A. Clay, who writes, favorite singing performance from a movie? Ever? Russell Crowe and Les Mis. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm no. Joking. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm Pierce sorry. Brosnan and Mamma Mia. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, this is a good question. Yeah. Like, cause you, uh, you could go Gene Kelly. You could go Fred Astaire. The, oh. I mean, best. You can go to the so old I'm movies if you want to, I'm a, I'm a musical guy, so this is a really tough question. I went through a phase where I really loved Rent, so I yeah. like anything Adina Menzel does. And even though the mm. Rent movie did not meet my expectations as a big fan of the Broadway show, yeah. I still thought she was great in that. And she's also great. I mean, clearly she's fantastic in Frozen because mm -hmm. that song is now iconic and unforgettable. Even if you want to forget it, it is drilled in your head. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about best, but I mean, most iconic is it's Dorothy singing Over the Rainbow uh, in true. Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. But best, that's, you know, or favorite is a different. I said, yeah, because I'm a, I'm a massive Gene Kelly fan, so I can't, I can't be asked this question. I can't, because I'll just, uh, everything <laughs> he's about ever done. What top three? Top three. Yeah, I mean, in American in Paris, there's so much that he's doing there that as a musical, a lover of musicals, you, he's breaking the genre. He's breaking the genre, and he's playing, he's singing different styles at the same time. You know, singing in the rain, the same thing. He evokes it, but then he also conveys what's happening here in the in, in modern music in the 50s at the time. You sound so stressed and working. I don't <laughs> understand. <laughs> I'm like, don't, you don't understand. Yourself. <laughs> this is one of my quietly favorite genres is musicals. Like, I hold them to my heart like you wouldn't believe. You I kind of have a random one. Um, the finale of Sister Act 2, which is Lauren mm. Hill. I love Sister Act. Yeah. The, Both the finale, movies. She, Lauren Hill. She's yeah. like incredible. And <gasps> I I will still like watch that movie and get up and sing along to it all the time. I haven't seen those movies, so I thought you were going to say like Whoopi Goldberg sang some song. I was like, uh, <laughs> Well, she does. She, she does. does. It's really good. Yeah. This, that second movie, I yeah. love the first. The second one is really freaking good. Yeah, I should really, start really a good. Sister Act We should club. do a Sister Act commentary. Oh, okay. How about that? Oh, that's there good. Is. Perry is like, I don't think anyone you, would watch what about that. You? Uh, top three, I have not in any particular order. Ewan McGregor in Moulin Rouge, mm. uh, Anna Kendrick, last five years, and then, of course, my girl, Julie Andrews, Sound of Music. Oh, yeah. All right. All right, guys, that's it for today's episode of Collider Movie Talk. I want to thank the people joining us at the table today. Perry, where can people find you? You guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram, at PNemeroff, on Collider Nightmares every Tuesday, best of the week, every Saturday, after Ash and the Walking Dead recap shows, Sunday night. Roka. Yeah, you guys can always find me at The Roka Says, R-O-C-H-A. See all the shows I'm hosting, co-hosting. Um, what do we have? What do I have? What do I have? The top 10 <laughs> show's gone. What do I have? I have this. Oh, you're, and there's you're, Walking you're, Dead. You're on the Walking, Walking Dead. Dead. That's right, oh, on yeah. Sundays, which is awesome. Please watch The Walking Dead. We, we, we're having such a great time this year Roka talking about it. Roka might have visited the Collider News set this morning, That's too. right. I Keep might have Collider News segments video. out coming out. That's right. <laughs> And also, of course, The Cinephiles, my podcast, which I'm really, really loving doing. We just did Die Hard. We dropped Shining today, The Shining Today, which mm. we talked about for an hour in its production, an hour and 15 in its production history. And Super Animation Game Time over on the Geek and Sundry Twitch channel. We had Dwight Schultz, Howling Mad Dog Murdoch last week, and we just had JP Cardiac, who was the voice of Reese in The Killing Joke on uh, this past Wednesday. So a lot of stuff. All right. Sinead? John, that was kind of sad. No, it doesn't mean that. He's like, what do I have? Well, sometimes I forget. Where's my home? Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, I'm online at Sinead DeFries and at That's Sinead.com here on Mondays hosting TV Talk, on Fridays hosting Movie Talk, and hosting Mailbag over the weekend. 
Wendy? You can find me on YouTube at The Movie Couple Channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero, Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos. And we will see you guys next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.